Another way to think of a p-value is it's the area in the tail or tails, tail for one-sided test, tails for two-sided test, when a test statistic is compared to the sampling distribution based on the null hypothesis. Here we've got our null hypothesis, our sampling distribution. So this, oftentimes we label this with H naught. For our example, the test statistic was X bar equals 2.80. This is going to be a lower tailed test because our alternate hypothesis is that the mean is less than three. For a lower tailed test, the p-value is the area in the tail under the sampling distribution to the left of our test statistic. 2.80, that's our x bar, is right there. So the p-value is simply the area underneath that curve to the left or in the tail of our distribution, of our sampling distribution. So that right there is the p-value. In order to calculate that, the p-value is just the probability that our average is going to be less than the test statistic, and that is the 2.80 that we obtained from our sample. We can plug that in. In Excel, we can use the norm.dist function, and we get that the area to the left of 2.80 underneath that sampling distribution is 0.02275. We can also use z values. We can take our test statistic of x bar. We can convert that to a z value by standardizing 2.80 minus our mean of 3, divide by sigma over root n. And we end up with the p value is the cumulative frequency of the standard normal distribution up to negative 2.00. You can use z tables, or you can use Excel, norm.s.dist. And you get the same thing that we got before, just using the norm.dist function, 0 0.02275. So that is the p-value. The p-value, in this case, is the area underneath the curve to the left of our standardized test statistic. We took x bar and we standardized to a z-value of negative 2, and that's our p-value. Let's take a look at a two-tailed test. This is from a previous screencast. We had five different sample yields. We have a standard deviation of three, and we want to calculate the p-value for this test. Our alternate hypothesis here is a two-tailed test. Two-tailed tests, by the way, are not that common because oftentimes you already have the data and your data suggests either an upper-tailed or a lower-tailed test. But since this is a two-tailed test, a p-value here is what's the probability of getting something more rare than x bar, which in this case corresponds to tails on either side. So that's a little bit confusing, but it's just kind of how a p-value is defined. The p-value for a two-tailed test is two times the probability that x bar is greater than our x bar here. And again, that's 90.48. If our sample average had been on the left side of the mean, then we would do two times the probability that x bar is less than x bar. We can calculate this using the norm.dist function in Excel, and the p-value ends up being 0.721. So this is not to scale, but really, if it were to scale, our p-value is going to be everything to the right of 90.48, but then we double that because technically p-value, you have to account for both sides of the distribution. How do we use p-values for hypothesis tests? The first step is to set up the one-tailed or two-tailed hypothesis test. You have your null hypothesis and your alternate hypothesis. You choose a risk level for the test, alpha. You collect your sample statistics. Note that oftentimes this step may actually be first. This might go up here because you might already have the experimental data available. You compute a p-value for the test, and that's what we've already done. And then you make your conclusion. If the p-value is less than your risk level of alpha, then you can accept the alternate hypothesis and reject the null. If the p-value is greater than alpha, you reject the alternate and fail to reject the null. There's no evidence that supports the alternate hypothesis. Let's take a look at our examples. We calculate a p-value of 0 0.02275. If we chose alpha of 0 0.05, then our conclusion would be to accept the alternate. Since our p-value, 0 0.02275, is less than our alpha of 0 0.05. What about if we chose alpha to equal 0 0.01? Would we accept 
or reject the alternate hypothesis. In this case, if alpha equals 0 0.01, then our conclusion would be to reject the alternate hypothesis since 0 0.02275 is greater than 0 0.01. For the second example, our two-tailed example, we got a p-value of 0 0.721. Obviously, this is much greater than the typical alpha values of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.02, and 0 0.01. So we would essentially reject the alternate based upon any value of alpha. Why use p-values? p-values have become quite common in the last couple decades. p-values essentially tell us how rare it is for our sample statistic, for example, x-bar, to have come from our assumed distribution. If a p-value is very small, then it's very rare that a sample average, for example, came from our assumed distribution. If a p-value is very large, then it tells us that that would be quite common. In essence, it gives us a degree to which we can accept or reject the alternate hypothesis. If our alpha level were 0.05 and we got a p-value of 0.049, we would still accept the alternate hypothesis. But if we had a p-value of something like 0.002, we would also accept the alternate hypothesis, but we would be much more confident with a lower p-value in accepting our alternate hypothesis. A lot of research papers and scientific papers these days report p-values, and it kind of allows the reader to come up with their own conclusion. If a p-value is very, very small, they're more confident than if the p-value is close to something like 0.05. An alpha of 0.05 still means there's a 1 in 20 risk level. Hopefully, this screencast gives you a better idea of how we can use p-values in hypothesis testing.